going to talk about a subject tonight. Uh, it's called Kingdom Here and Now, and it's something that the Lord kind of, uh, April said this Sunday, I thought it was so sweet. She said it was a precious whisper. A precious whisper. That's what I felt like it was, like a precious whisper. The kingdom here and now. And, and, I, and I felt like the Lord was telling me by the Holy Spirit, there are some things I need you to understand about the kingdom that are available here and now that you still don't get. And so... When I was praying at home this afternoon, I was home all by myself because my husband, Pastor Aaron, and my only kid left at home, Jude Aaron, are on a man's trip. He's ministering in um, Houston, Texas tonight at Faith Family Church, some good friends of ours. And Jude is like thinking he's on the preaching circuit now, right? He just turned 16 and he didn't even want to go to school this year because he's, you know, called to minister. So I'm like, you just need to probably learn how to spell things first. So let's, let's keep on with school. But uh, he is traveling with his dad every chance he gets. So I had an exceptionally quiet afternoon. And uh, as I was praying, I really um, asked the Lord, kind of, like, why is it that we don't understand this fully the way you want us to? And there's a lot of reasons. How many were raised in church? Okay, now don't get mad at me. How many know that not everything you hear in every church is right? Oh, all the same hands. So see, we're not alone. I got to be honest, there are times that I'll listen back to something I preached maybe 15 or 20 years ago, and I'm like, man, that, that wasn't really that good. That, that, mm, that was questionable. But, you know, the more you grow and the more you mature and the more you study, the, the word, you know, tells us to study, to show yourself approved, you know, rightly divide the word of truth. And so we're all growing in it, but not everything we've ever heard in church was the truth of the word of God. A lot of times what we hear in church is a lot of emotionalism, and I get it. I am quite emotional if you don't know me. But just because I'm emotional doesn't mean I don't have to rightly divide. And so as I was praying, the Lord said there's things that people have heard all their lives that they think are true, even though they were never spoken from my mouth. And so I remembered a, a, a part in scripture, it's in Luke, where Jesus had been crucified, he was raised again, and he was appearing into, to the disciples. Well, you know, he was, he was meeting people along the road. And it says that he went in and they stood there in disbelief, and he was trying to explain to them, but the word, you know, we, this has already been prophesied, I've already said that this was going to happen. And it said that they were just in disbelief at his words. But they were words that he'd already spoken before. So there are words I'm going to read tonight that you've already heard before, but we just didn't hear them right. And this is what Jesus said in the very middle of Luke 24. In the um, New Living, he said this, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And that scripture just kind of came alive in my heart. In a couple other translations, he said he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scripture. The Passion says he supernaturally unlocked their understanding to receive the revelation of the scripture. And the last one I'll read to you, the Amplified says it this way, then he opened their minds to help them understand scripture. How many of you have been in church for so long and you've probably heard a similar kind of sermon over and over, but one day it finally takes root in your spirit. And in that day you're like, Oh, now that's different. I, I, you guys mostly know my story, but I, I, was, I, I was in church a lot. Didn't mean church was in me, but I was in church. And I'm telling you what, I would, I would get in church sometimes, and I would listen. And I, I was, my parents, when they first were saved, we went to this very little church called the House of God. And it was way out somewhere in Michigan, and it was really like a little family church. But they were wild Holy Ghost people. I mean, crazy. And I saw all kinds of things in that church. And I remember seeing it. I remember it registering on me. But the older I got, the further removed I got from those truths. And, uh, and things just started seeming different in my life and if if you know my story at all I had gotten diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was in uh, high school and very sick at that time I'm not old but it was a while ago and there was not like a cure for it there wasn't really remission for it they just basically are like you have it and eventually you'll die from it bad news when a kid's like 20 and I had heard in all kinds of church services Jesus is a healer but just because I heard Jesus is a healer doesn't mean I had experienced his healing in that way. 
And the same time I heard people say, well, Jesus can heal. How many ever say Jesus can? Jesus can do anything. But I remember, because sometimes you don't pay attention until you really need it. I was at college, Southwestern Assemblies God University. I met this boy named Aaron Hankins. And a long story short, we were talking one night. We weren't even dating yet, and I had taken time off school one semester, so I was back visiting some people and setting up my schedule for the next semester. And he said, so what's wrong with you anyway, girl? <laughs> Y'all think he's sweet. He's a little sassy. And so uh, I said, well, I told him the story. I had Crohn's disease. He said, well, you know, Jesus already bore your sicknesses and carried away your diseases. Scripture says, by his stripes, you were healed. Do you know what tense of that word is, were healed? I was like, yeah, past tense. I'm an English major, past. I got that. And something about that word in that moment started something on the inside of me that began to build my faith. And I believe Jesus in that moment unlocked my mind from all the religious talk and the, and the he can if he wants to, but I'm going to really talk about Jesus from my experience and not from the word kind of talk. And what I want tonight is to break through all of that stuff. Well, I mean, okay, end of the story. He started giving me some books and things. I went back home. I started reading these books that I'd found. I really built my faith up like Jesus really did everything he's going to do about my healing. He already died, and it says he carried all sickness and disease. They're under the curse of the law. He was made a curse for me. It's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The root word there means he lifted them off. NASA, lift, NASA space program, they got their word from the Bible. Lifted up and carried it away. So I started dating that boy semester back. I want you to come meet my family. I didn't know anything about Southern Church at all. Y'all are church church down here. We were church up north. Y'all are church, church. And there used to be an aisle down the middle, and we came right up the middle aisle. We were a little late because we drove in from Dallas, and that traffic's awful. And so we got here, and Brother Hagen was up here, and he said, tonight, uh, we miss praise and worship. But first thing I heard when I walked in those doors, tonight I'm going to teach on divine healing. And I thought, oh, praise the Lord. I sat right where Laney was sitting. He preached. I got prayed for. I was completely healed. I've never been sick with that another day in my life. What happened? The word was always available. The word was always true. But I was not always receiving the word and working it in my life the way that the Lord wanted me to receive it and work it in my life. But here's the good news when you learn to work the word for you. You filter all you know. You get some biblical understanding. You become somebody who's like, you know what? I'll listen to your opinions now and then, but, but I know the one who wrote the book. And I'm going to read the book, and I'm going to get the truth on it. And every, now every thought I have has got to be filtered not through my past experience. It's got to be filtered through this book. And if I can't find it in the book, I'm not going to speak it over my life. And I believe tonight what's going to happen when we address the kingdom of God here and now is your mind's going to begin to get opened up and your spirit's going to start receiving things that it didn't receive before because you are rightly hearing the word. I'll tell you the truth. When I started studying, one of the outstanding things I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, he said, I'm tired of my people having low level living. I don't want you to raise your hands or nothing. But I'm sure everyone in the room, even if you're living better than you've ever lived in your life, you could say, well, I could imagine some better stuff. I could imagine a better, anybody, I, can, I could take a better life. I mean, I, I've got a great husband, great kids, things are going well, but they can always get better. And sometimes in the church world, we've been told, well, you shouldn't expect it. That is the furthest thing from the truth. That's a bunch of junk if I ever heard it. Jesus didn't come so that I could have a little bit better life. He came that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Life as God himself has it. Good life. And so all that to get to this. We are going to study the kingdom tonight. And um, I, am, I am, it's helping me so much in my own life. And so I, I like when that happens, when I can kind of work it a little bit first and then give it to y'all. And I encourage you, take, take what you can. And even if you're like, ooh, that hits me wrong. I don't, I don't know about that. I, here's what I encourage you to do. You don't have to believe anything because I say it. You go home and you look it up in this scripture. You study it out. 
And I believe God will illuminate it to you. So you don't have to take my word for it, but you got to take his word for it, right? And so in, in Matthew 6, verse 10, we all know this. In the King James Version, it says Jesus is, is, is speaking, and he said, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. He said, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means God has an expectation. If Jesus said it, that makes it true. He is the word made flesh. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then just a little bit later, down toward the end of that chapter in Matthew 6, 31 through 34, again, Jesus, he says to them, therefore, do not worry, saying. You know, sometimes when you're feeling worried, the best thing you can do is just close your mouth. I'm not letting you come out of there. He said, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? How many of you honestly today thought about what you was going to eat? I did. How many think about what we're going to eat after? It's good. I mean, we think about that. Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? You know when, when like, Aaron goes to the closet or Jude goes to, Jude especially, Jude goes to his closet, he's like, I got nothing to wear. You know why? Because there ain't nothing left. It's all dirty. When I go to the closet, I'm like, I ain't got nothing to wear. It means there's nothing I like right now. You know the difference? But he says, don't worry about what you're going to drink or what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. For all of these things Gentiles seek, but your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Anybody ever wasted today worrying about tomorrow when it didn't even come yet? I'm really getting help with this. I used to think about all the things that could happen tomorrow, and now I'm just like too tired. <laughs> nope, we'll deal with it tomorrow. But God said, don't worry about, Jesus Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. I know what you need already. Some of you can take a load off that God already knows what you need. And then he goes on and he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then watch how all these things are just added to you. He didn't say you have to beg him for clothes or beg him for food. Or ask him, oh, Jesus, please give me a drink of water. No, no, no. He said, you seek me, and all the things will follow you. You follow God, the things follow you. Everybody don't like this. They're like, oh, well, we're not supposed to have anything on earth. Well, you know, ask Jesus. Again, let the Holy Ghost work on your brain. I know, religion is a hard thing to get over. Don't worry about tomorrow. Our provision in our life seems to be connected to deeply what we seek and what we put our attention on, what we look at, what we talk about, that seems to be what we're connected to. And here's the thing about the kingdom of heaven. You can't see it naturally, but you can see it. You dig into the word of God and you'll begin to see the kingdom. It'll become real to you. And Aaron and I have been saying this so much more recently, but the older you get, the more uh, there's a possibility that you know people who have gone on to their heavenly home. They've gone on to heaven. And it's like the more people I know that get there, the more real it becomes. And it just, you start thinking, I know when I was 15 or 16, people like, oh, Jesus is coming soon. I'm like, God, I hope not. I want to live, you know. And I get that. I understand. I understand. But there's still this reality of heaven. And it's true. The kingdom, if you just look it up in a normal dictionary, dictionary um, uh, definition, it means a community, a major territorial unit having a monarchical form of government headed by a king or a queen. It means the eternal kingship of God. But this last one, the kingdom means the realm in which God's will is fulfilled. That's just in the regular dictionary. The kingdom is the realm in which God's will is is fulfilled. Okay? So the kingdom can be a really hard subject for us to grasp because we are a part of a time 
in society where opinion is very loud, culture is very loud, secularism is very loud, humanism is very loud. We have these measuring sticks that are man-made and not God-made. We have all of these things that we look at, but just because it's the world's way does not mean it's God's way. God's way is always kingdom. And when we met him, he said, you became a part of my kingdom, not the other way around. I'm not, he's not trying to like help us live agreeably with every person on earth. He's trying to help us learn how to live in the realm of the kingdom. And when we learn to live in the realm of the kingdom, when you look around here, it don't look good anymore. Everything in our life, it, it has with it like feelings, thoughts, emotions, actions, the way that we see and do life. How many of you ever said this growing up? I'm never going to say, I'm never going to talk like that, like my mama talked to me. And then one day you're talking to your daughter and you're like, oh my God. I just heard my mother. I mean, anybody be honest about it? Yeah. And sometimes in our life, we do things because we've just been brought that way, brought up that way. We've been conditioned that way. That's the way that we've always done it. But how many know the way you've always done it doesn't make it right? How many want to break out of those things so that you can move higher? You can go higher. We rebranded this whole ladies meeting to the ascent because I felt like the Lord said, it's time for you to tread upon your high places. It's time for you to get up. It's time for you to go up. I'm tired of you living here, girl. It's time for you to live here. And I want all the women to live here. How many know there are higher heights for you? There are some high places. And God said, I want your feet to tread upon those. But we're not going to do it doing the same thing we've always done. We've got to learn to see different and think different. So if what we do and what we think and how we feel and how we act doesn't line up with kingdom, we got to change it. Well, you know the only thing in the whole world that don't change? Change. Change is change. Is change. Everything else. So in Luke 17... You saw this on uh, the opening video that we had here. Kelly made it. It was beautiful. Luke 17, 20 and 21. This has been the scripture that's had my attention for quite a while now. Again, Jesus is talking. And it says, having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he replied, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed or with a visible display, nor will people say, look, here it is, or look, there it is. For the kingdom of God is among you because of my presence. The kingdom of God is among you because of my presence. Now, you remember I gave you the dictionary definition of the kingdom, the realm in which God's will is fulfilled, but there's this other dictionary you should get your hands on, and it's called the Bible Dictionary. And this is like the biblical definition of the word kingdom. So when Jesus said the kingdom of God is among you because I'm standing here, this is what it meant. The royalty, the rule, the realm, the reign. The foundation of power or a sovereign king. You can leave that up there a minute so if they're taking notes they can write it. But here's what Jesus said. It's not just a place my will is fulfilled. My presence, you're asking, when am I going to see the kingdom of God? He said, you've already missed it. I'm already here. The kingdom is already among you because I'm standing here. Let me tell you something, ladies. We're worshiping Jesus tonight. The scripture says he's here because he's here. The kingdom of heaven is here. And because the kingdom of heaven is here, you can partake of all that the kingdom has to offer. He's saying there's royalty here. Rule, reign, power. I don't know about you, I like those words. I really like those words better than their opposites. In the Passion, the same verse, says Jesus once was asked by the Jewish religious leaders, when will God's kingdom come? And he responded, God's kingdom does not come simply by obeying principles or waiting for signs. The kingdom is not discovered in one place or another. For the kingdom realm is already expanding within some of you. What was Jesus saying? What I've got, I give it to you. And what I got, I got it from my father. So where did you get it from? The kingdom of heaven? 
where God is ruling and reigning and supreme. It is the foundational place of power in this earth. And he says, I am giving some, it's expanding in some of you right now. Why some of you? Because not everybody will believe it. Not everybody will understand it. Not everybody will walk in it, but everybody could. You can, and you should. So he's really saying the kingdom is, is already ruling and reigning and expanding in you. There is power in you. So here's something I want you to write down about the kingdom. The kingdom of God lives in us before it does a work around us. The kingdom does a work in us. It lives in us before it does a work around us. So many times we want to say, God, I just want your will to be done. And he's like, I do too, but I'm going to need it to work in you first. Oh, but God could do it if he wanted to. No, that's actually not true. He is tied to our, our, what is that word, like our working together with him. God's word is full of if you, then I. It's an if-then relationship. If you confess me as Lord, I'll move in. If you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you open the door, I'll come in. I'll sit down and dine with you. But he's not going to break into your door. He's not a thief. He's not a robber. you got to open the door. So yes, God could do anything, but that's not the way the kingdom works. Get in his word and read it. There are things he needs from you. He wants you to cooperate with him so that he can do everything he wants to do in your life. You know, this is interesting that he started talking about the kingdom right here because if you read earlier in Luke there, it talks about the things that Jesus had just done. Jesus had just done things that were directly anti-culture and acceptable at the time. He had just talked to the disciples about faith. He said, if you've got faith as the size of a mustard seed, you can say to that tree, be uprooted and cast in the sea and it'll obey you. You can move mountains with faith the size of a mustard seed. And then it said there was some sick, 10 sick lepers outside, you know. In Bible days when people got leprosy, they kicked them far, far away. And they just left them to die. They would throw food their way every so often. And they would just sit there with leprosy and it would eat their skin until they, until they died. And Jesus, he, what is he doing? He's showing us the kingdoms in you. He said, I'm going to go to them. Not only did he go to them. While everybody's talking bad about him, do you know being a kingdom person really helps you not care what everybody else says about you? It really helps you not be bothered when they're like, I can't believe she, who does she think she is? Well, how much time do you got, sis? Because I got a list of good things. I got a list of things that Jesus has done in me that unless you got ours, we don't have time to get started because he's been real good to me. I was real bad, but I'm not real bad no more. I was living low, but I'm not living low no more. I'm not ashamed of what Jesus has done in my life and nothing you can say about it can make me ashamed. He's blessed me because he's good, not because I'm good. He blessed me because I'm covenant with him. I'm a giver, I'm a tither, and he is faithful to his word. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen a seed begging bread. You're not going to see my kids going hungry. Covenant with God. People are like, I don't like that. I don't care. I've been broke. Blessed is better. Religious devils run. So Jesus goes to these ten lepers, and not only did he converse with them, by standing by them, because they thought every time somebody was sick, oh, it had to be sin. Who sinned? The mom, the dad, them? What did they do? They started making stuff up. Don't, don't be one of those religious people. I wonder what happened in their life that God's getting them like that. First of all, God don't get you like that. The devil gets you like that. The devil's the thief. The devil's the author of sickness. The devil's the author of lack and poverty and all of these things. That's not God. Oh, well, I wonder how they open the door. You are not a Bible scholar. I don't think you should touch that. Pray for them and bless them. That's all you need to do. But Jesus went out, and they're all talking. He's going to talk to the sinners. He's going to go out there and talk to them. He's going to, I mean, what's he think he's going to do? He's going to get it. Jesus Jesus is getting leprosy. 
It says, Jesus went out and he began to touch them. And the leprosy began to heal. And their arms began to grow back and their noses began to grow back and they were all healed. And then he didn't say, stay out here and keep it a secret. He said, oh, no, no, no. When I do stuff, I like to do stuff. When I do stuff, I like people to know I'm good. I don't want them to wonder about what happened out here. Y'all, let's go back into town and just freak them out a little bit. And so they all start going back where they say, oh, you can't come back in here. Don't you come. But they come in healed and they're like, what is going on? They were healed. Isn't it interesting that it does say this, though? They were healed, but there was more available. Do you know healing and wholeness is different? God can heal you, but there's still some deficiencies. Wholeness is something different altogether. Spirit, soul, and body. I am a brand new person. It's like it never even happened. And it said one of them turned around and said, Jesus, I just want to thank you. And he said, that's made you whole. Now you got something that the other nine didn't get. And tonight you can get something that nobody else on your row gets. If you receive the truth of the word of God, you can get your healing, but you can also leave whole. You can also leave and there'll be no trace of any of that junk ever went on in your life because God is a restorer. What is he talking about? My kingdom come. My will be done on earth as it is in heaven. His will was not for those 10 lepers to die outside of the camp. And his will for you is not sickness and disease and lack and poverty and shame and guilt and condemnation. His will for you is all the kingdom of heaven. People talk about first what they value most. Write that down. People talk about first what they value most. When Jesus came on the scene, the first thing he started talking about was the kingdom of his father. And, you know, my, one of my daughters put something up a few days ago on her Instagram, and it was this little clip of a, a, a minister, a great minister, talking to um, singles and young adults, and he was talking about dating. And he's like, I'm, I'm for dating. I think you should go on dates. He said, but I've got this, like, first hour rule. He said, if within the first hour, he goes, I tell my own kids it needs to be the first five minutes. But in the first, fi in the first hour, if they don't talk about anything spiritual, if they don't talk about God, they don't talk about Jesus, they don't talk about church, they don't talk about the will of God, they don't talk about anything like that, they are not the one for you. Because people talk about first what they value most. What did Jesus value? The kingdom. I want to tell you about a kingdom. It's not this kingdom. There's another kingdom. And I'm, I'm, I'm a part of that kingdom. And I want you to be a part of that kingdom. So his first words were about the kingdom. So my question to you is, what are your first words? When you get together with people, what do you talk about? What do you pursue? What do you demand concerning your kingdom rights? I mean, I know a lot of you enough to know that if you went into a store tomorrow and there was a sales sticker on something you specifically liked and you went up to the register and that sticker said $9.99, but they rang it up and they were like $19.99, Jermina. You'd be like, oh no, $9.99 and I'm getting it for $9.99 because it say $9.99 and that is false advertising and I can call the people. We always want to say that. What people? They ain't nobody coming. Alexandria. But I mean, you know, if you go at it enough, you know what the lady's going to say? Just take it. $9.99. We'll demand our rights over a stupid shirt we're going to wear once and then have buyer's remorse because it's $10 we don't got and the shirt is ugly. But I'm telling you what, there are some things in the kingdom that we have kingdom rights to and we don't fight about them ever. The devil comes in and he tries to mess with your mind again. You're like, well, I guess I'll just give him 24 hours and be sad. But last time you gave him 24 hours, it turned into six Six months. You can't give him anything. You say, I command my kingdom rights. There is peace in heaven. There is joy in heaven. There is soundness in heaven. And I am a member of the kingdom of heaven. So you take your stuff and you go. Oh, but I can't talk to the devil like that. Why? You talk meaner to one another than we talk to the devil. I mean, don't think we're bad parents, okay? But there was a time 
we learned this from other friend, but we didn't think it through very well. And we said, you can curse the devil. Now, I didn't mean curse like four-letter word curses. I meant like curse him. He's cursed. And they said, we can. <laughs> then it was the oldest. It was Avery. She said, I can say whatever I want. I said, the meanest thing you can think. She said, you go to hell, devil. And then she looked up. I was like, oh, yeah. He already lives there, but that's not what we meant. <laughs> but there are times you just need to demand your kingdom rights. I'm a citizen of heaven. That means the devil cannot just come in and do anything that he wants. So what do you focus on? What do you talk about? How do your conversations go? What do you demand? What do you expect? What do you think about? What do you meditate on? If there is an issue in any area of your life, it's relationally, marriage, with your children, with your finances, in your home, in your health, in your mental health, in your emotions, whatever it is, get the kingdom on it. Matthew 21, verse 43 in the New Living. Again, Jesus says this, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation who will produce the proper fruit. It just, it pricked my heart a little bit. Because Jesus is so serious. He said, there's one thing I need you to understand about the kingdom. It requires you to bear the proper fruit. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. One requirement that is so overlooked is our commandment to produce proper kingdom fruit. You know, there's those smarties who always want to be like, you can't judge me kind of people. You ever heard? I know. See, it's one of those cultural things. Everybody's like, your butt like sat harder in your seat when I said that. You're like, what's she going to, where's she going to go? I'll tell you. You ever met somebody who like straight living in sin? They're like, only God can judge me. I'm like, and I'm sure he has. I mean, you know, we love people. We love you. It don't mean you're living right. But do you know God told us? You can, you can see how people are living by the fruit that's produced from their life. And Jesus said, I, there's some fruit I want from you because I want you, the kingdom of God requires you to produce certain fruit. And it's a, it, it's a something that he requires. So we need to spend I would say a lot more time finding out what the kingdom calls proper fruit, success, appropriateness for the kingdom, and a lot less time on what the world calls success. Because it might look successful, but if there's not any kingdom fruit, it will burn. It's not going to matter. I mean, there, there have been times, Aaron and I, you know, we've gone through some things. And in ministry and church life, you've gone through some things. And there were moments in our life where, I don't think they'd mind us saying it, like your uh, Pastor Mark, our father, my father-in-law, Aaron's daddy, was like, look, I know it's been tough. I know people are being mean, but if you want to leave, you can leave. I haven't talked to so-and-so. It's a good gig. You can go down there and you can, they need somebody. You can move up, back up north. There's a place. They got 10,000 people in the church. Why? There's pressure. But as sure as I'm standing, you, Aaron and I started praying, and we were just like, but it's really not successful. If there's 10,000 people, but God didn't call me, that ain't fruit. God said Alexandria. He didn't say if the people aren't ugly. He said Alexandria. So you know what we did? Well, ta-da! Why? Because we're bearing the fruit that God expects from us. I want to see Sinla saved. I want to see Alexandria saved. Why did we knock on every door in this city for a million years? Because God said, there will be fruit. And do you know for years, ain't nobody come here because we knocked on their door. You talk about frustrating. But then about five years in, craziest thing. People start showing up. How'd you hear about the church? When you brought one of those Book of John's to our door on a Saturday, I about fell out. First time somebody told me, I cried like a baby. I was like, I thought it didn't work. And God said, when you do things my way, it'll always bear fruit. Yeah. 
It might not bear fruit in 10 seconds. It might not bear fruit tomorrow, but it's going to bear fruit. And when it bears fruit, it don't matter what it, how is that church growing in the middle of this situation? Because God's fruit will come when you need it most. He will supply. He will make a way because you have done what he's called you to do. You are bearing kingdom fruit. The Lord told me this about our, for our staff uh, two Thursdays ago in prayer. He told me, come in here and you tell him your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And the Lord just told me to tell you, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The things you've been doing, the prayers you've been praying, the seeds you've been sowing, it is not in vain. It's of the kingdom, and it's going to bear fruit at the proper time. Amen? And then in James 1, 16 through 18, it says this, so my very dear friends, don't get thrown off course. Every desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. The gifts are rivers of light cascading down from the Father of light. There is nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle. He brought us to life using the true word, showing us off as the crown of all his creatures. He's like, of all my things I've made, you're my favorite. Of everything I've done, you're my favorite. You're the one that I crown. You're the one that I love. You're the one that I'm pulling for. And he says this, don't get thrown off course, because every good, desirable, beneficial gift comes from heaven. That's meaning if your best gifts haven't come from heaven, those aren't the best gifts. Some of y'all need to stop settling for earthly, just normal stuff. Because when a harvest comes from God, you know the harvest came from God. Because it's just, it does something on the inside of you. It gives you joy. You know that it's God doing it. Amen? Every good and beneficial gift. Now, I don't know a better example. We talk about this kind of a lot. But how many have kids in the room? How many were kids? Everybody had experience. There we go. So there are some certain things Avery, Macy, and Jude are a part of because they are our children. They are part of our home, our family. And in our home, they can know there's going to be provision for you. There's going to be safety for you. You're going to have a bed to sleep on and clothes to wear and food to eat and things to drink. And you're going to have love in this house. I mean, I feel like we're going to give you the best we know how to give you. And so... When my kids were, well, it still happens with Jude. I got one in the house, still happens. But there were times when they would come to me, and they would, in a whiny, bratty way, I'm so hungry. I'm like, well, we just ate. I'm, but I'm so hungry. I'm just, like desperate, like fall out on the floor. Oh, I need something. And I would, for a time, get like, it makes me feel things when my kids do stuff like this. I feel things. First thing I feel is confusion, because you just ate. Also, we have food. The next thing is, like, anger. Because I'm like, we just ate. I don't like to cook, but I did it. We asked you if you were full, and you promised you were, and you couldn't eat another thing off of that plate. Ten minutes later, you are starving, rolling on the floor, about to die of starvation. Now I'm mad. Well, there's a basket of approved snacks in the pantry. But I don't want that. Well, you wanted it when I was buying it at the grocery store. But I want, I, want, I want ice cream. Well, you know, I have an ice cream. Why? Because you're going to go to sleep in a minute. But I'm so hungry, I can't sleep. You'll, God will make a way. He'll, he'll do it. I mean, and I would just get angry because they would do that at times when there were other people at the house. And I thought, I will kill you. <laughs> Acting like you're about to die. Because you are wrongly giving, painting this picture that we are not good parents, and we don't care for you, and we don't love you, and there's just never any food, and you never feed me. <laughs> Avery used to suck in her stomach and be like, look how hungry I am. I, oh, I couldn't take it. And there were nights I would just be like, 
Do you know how good we are to you? Do you know how blessed you are? There's a reason your friends want to be at our house. We're the fun ones. We're the snack people. We, right? And it would make me angry. And it make me a little confused and a little sad. And you know what the Lord said? I know how you feel. Excuse me, sir? What? Is that you, God? Because I, what? I know how you feel because my kids act like that all the time. They got a house that's a better house than they used to have. They got a car that's a better car than they used to have. They make more money now than they've ever made. They got better relationships now than they've ever had. And they still act like I can't meet their needs and I don't know what they need. And I don't understand how they feel. And they want to lay down and cry about it for a while. But guess what? I'm a good God and I know it. Uh, How many know I repented real quick? Real quick. We can't doubt God's provision or his promises for us. His promises are yes and amen. His provision is already covered by the blood of Jesus. He can't go back on it if he wanted to. If he said it, he'll make it good. He will do it. So if you are not walking in the provision and promise of God, you've got to examine you, not examine God. You've got to question you, not question God. You've got to question your understanding of his word and your application of his word and your walking in obedience to the words you do know and don't question God.